in the year 1464 at the, so let me get the name of the church right, Santa Maria del Fiore in Florence, Italy, there was this massive slab of marble that they commissioned someone to build a statue out of, but the first person that was commissioned to do it bored a hole in the rock. They thought that the slab was ruined. That is, until about 50 years later, this artist named Michelangelo traveled to Italy, looked at the piece of marble, and decided that he, in fact, could use it. It was not ruined, that he could turn it into a beautiful statue. And so he began constructing what became the very statue of young David holding the sling. Well, the mayor of Florence, Italy, as he was working on it, and right as he was about to finish it up, came to his shop to check to see how it was going. And the mayor looked at the statue and said, you know, the nose, it's a little too big. And so Michelangelo grabbed his chisel, a little bit of marble dust in his hand, and he climbed the scaffolding, invited the mayor to join him up there. And he started lightly tapping around didn't actually do anything to the nose, but as he tapped, he allowed a little bit of the dust to fall out of his hand so that it appeared as though he was working on it. And after a few minutes of chiseling away, he, he said, what do you think now? And the mayor said, boy, that has really come up. Love it. Well, what Michael was able to do with that piece of slab is something that people in our lives need to do for us. He was able to see not what it was, but what it could become. And the Bible has a word for people like that. The Bible calls them encouragers. And encouragers are people who see something within us that we don't necessarily see in ourselves, and they call it out of us through positive words of affirmation. I don't know about you, I've had several people in my life that I would consider major encouragers for me. My parents, both sets of my grandparents, my wife, my in-laws. I've had preachers and youth ministers in my life who have been encouraging to me. I've had many elders, including the elders here, who are very encouraging to me. Just the other day, Raymond told me, one day you're going to make a good preacher. And I just, (laughs) just kidding, Raymond, just kidding. Now, we all need encouragers in our life. One author said, encouragement is like oxygen to the human spirit. It lifts us up, inspires us, and enables us to see the potential within ourselves. Another writer said, a word of encouragement during a failure is worth more than an hour of praise after success. That is so true. It's just really hard to receive the encouragement right after the failure, but it is so valuable. I love what Max Lucado said. He said, People have a way of becoming what you encourage them to be, not what you nag them to be. And so just like John just read to us, we need to encourage one another. It is so important that we spend time intentionally trying to build one another up. And the reason why is because we're living in a time of discouragement. We don't call it discouragement. We have a different name for it. We call it marketing. And so as you find yourself watching TV or watching videos on YouTube or scrolling social media, you see all of these you. They are going after all of these deficiencies within you. And so you this face cream because well you or they'll try to sell you and target you with these clothes. And these are clothes that are in style and they look exactly like the clothes to own back in the 80s and 90s, but you got rid of those, they went out of style. And had you known 30 years or so later they were going to come back in style, you would have kept them, but you were told then they were out of style, now they're back in, now you have to go back and buy more because what you're wearing, it's out of style again. And, And you just see these ads over and over again. You're being sold t-shirts that will fit your dad bod, or as one guy called it the other day that I heard, he said, a good father figure. You're sold this spray because apparently we all stink. And it's just one ad after we find ourselves just scrolling social media from time to time, and we don't realize what we're doing, that we're entering into someone's highlights, and it very, very well may be that we're reading or watching their highlights during one of our lowlights. And so you see that couple that it seems like every week goes on a date night while you haven't been on a date night in months. Or maybe it is that you see that 
fitness influencer and you're like, man, I wish I could do that right as you finish that last bite of the bowl of ice cream. Or there's that person that goes on all the trips. They are one of those exotic travelers and you're watching that as you finish your microwave dinner. And you're comparing your lowlights to their highlights. And what do I need to do? I need to be encouraged. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to church. That's where I'll find some encouragement. And you walk into church, and you're dealing with depression, you're battling anxiety, you're already anxious about going, and then you're dealing with all these other things and struggles that you've been going through mentally and spiritually. You haven't prayed in a long time. You haven't read your Bible in weeks. And you walk in, and everybody's smiling, and everybody looks nice, and you think, man, my life is a wreck all of these things going wrong and everybody else appears to be so perfect and then you think, why can't I just be perfect like them? Well, first off, no one here is perfect, not even close. And if our smiles ever put off the sense for you that we have it all together, that's not what the smile is for. The smile is just a greeting. The smile is because we serve the one who is perfect. There's a lot of struggles in this room. Even among those who you might consider to be the strongest spiritually. A lot of struggles, a lot of weakness. And don't let the smiles make you think that you don't fit in. It's just a way for us to say, you're here. Whatever you're bringing, we don't want you to get back in your car feeling discouraged as you leave because you walked out with the same discouragement you walked in with. It's not why we're here. We're here to encourage one another. So there's this scene in Matthew chapter 16 where Jesus decided he was going to ask his disciples a question. And he said, what are people saying about me? Who do they say that I am? And, you know, they're kind of giving some responses, but then he looks at them and he says, well, who do you say that I am? And it's probably like when you were in school and your teacher asked you a question or asked the class a question, you didn't really know the answer. You didn't feel confident about it. And so you just look down, you just try not to make eye contact. If I don't look, maybe they won't call me. And you're just waiting on somebody else to answer, please, somebody up. And then Peter finally speaks up. Do you remember Peter? He was a fisherman and a, a foot-shaped mouth. I totally identify with him. His words got him into a lot more trouble than him out of trouble. And the phrase he says is right on. He responds to Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. He's saying, you are the one we've been waiting for. You are the promised one. You're the one that's been anointed by God to rescue us and to deliver us. You're not just the final word. You are the only word from God. And then Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. And maybe that phrase doesn't have that strong impact for you, but if you could picture Jesus giving him a high five or a chest bump or a standing ovation, he's like, great job. Peter, that's exactly right. That's exactly who I am. You got to imagine Simon Peter's feeling pretty good about himself. And Jesus says this. He says, I tell you, you are Peter. Now, up until this moment, he had been known as Simon, not known as Peter. Jesus is going to give him a new name. He's going to give him a nickname. This word Peter is the Greek word Petra, which just means rock. In fact, he says, you are Peter, you are a rock, and on this rock, I'm going to build my church. He, he called him the rock, the rock. He, he gave him that name, solid confession. It needed a rock solid nickname. And can you imagine for Peter how he felt about this? Jesus says, we're not you Simon anymore. We're calling you the rock. And then as they go along and Peter does something really good and they get done and afterward Jesus just throws his arms around him. He's like, I love you, Rocky. I love you, man. And then, Jesus, and then Peter does something good for Jesus, maybe something kind. And he's like, thank you, the rock. And he's like, you're welcome. Just an ordinary, sorry, I couldn't, couldn't resist the joke. Most of you have never seen Moana, obviously. Hmm, we got a lot of work to do here today. What Jesus does for Peter is what Michelangelo did to that piece of... Yeah, Peter looked really rough on the surface. 
a guy who had a loose mouth and didn't know how to control his words. Maybe somebody that people would have called a loose cannon. But Jesus looked at him and saw a rock. And what Jesus began to do over the next couple of years is lightly chisel away at that rough exterior and call out from Peter someone who'd become a great leader in the church, someone who has greatly influenced each of us that are here today. Because that's what encouragers do. You see, the word encouragement in the Bible, it comes from a word that's really a combo word, and it means to come alongside, and it means to call out. Not I like to embarrass somebody. You've had people that have done that before. They've walked up beside you, and they've called something out, and it embarrassed you. That's not what the word encouragement means. It means to come alongside and to call out of that person a quality that you can see from within them that maybe they don't even see themselves. And you call that quality out, and you encourage them with it. So here's my question for us today. How can we encourage one another? I want to share with you another scene from the life of Jesus that I think will illustrate well for us. It comes from Matthew 5, and as you open there, like it's a chaotic scene. Jesus gets off the boat on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and he's, and he's instantly met by a frantic father. This dad has a little girl who's dying. She's on her deathbed, and this dad is desperate. He will do anything to save his daughter. And so he comes to Jesus, and he begs him, please come save my daughter. And Jesus says, sure, let's go. And so this guy named Jesus starts making his way through the crowd. But as Jesus walks through, people hear, and so they all want to see Jesus. So people are gathering like crazy. And where they were once able to walk easily, now there's this mountain. You just got to imagine what a dad's going to do. He's just moving people out of the way, pushing them out of the way, getting Jesus through this crowd. And at some point, there was another lady in the crowd. We're not told her name. We're just told her problem. She's been bleeding for 12 years. She's gone to a lot of doctors. She's gone broke. She's gone desperate. And she just thinks to herself, if I could just get close to him, if I could just grab hold to the hem of his garment, then I would be healed. And so as Jairus is pushing people out of the way, she presses in right behind them, and then her moment of truth comes. She reaches out, and she grabs hold to just the back end of his garment. Instantly, she's healed. She feels it in her body, complete healing. Jesus knows something's happened. He feels this power of healing flow out of him, so he stops. And if you're Jairus, you're like, what is going on? We've got to go. Jesus said, who touched me? It's like, what do you mean who touched? Literally everybody has touched you. No, somebody just got healed. And what you'll read next, I think, is a great recipe for how we can encourage one another. The first thing it says is that Jesus looked around to see who touched him. He looked around. And that's just a reminder for us that if we want to be encouragers for one another, We've got to look for opportunities. Those opportunities for encouragement usually don't come with this flashing neon sign saying, hey, this is an opportunity for you to be an encourager. It usually requires us to pay attention. Sometimes we have to pay attention to body language. Sometimes you can see people that are carrying burdens. They look down, and that's an opportunity to share some encouragement. Sometimes you have to listen to and you even have to listen to what they don't say. Sometimes you have to read in between the lines. Sometimes you have to look out and see someone that might be sitting alone. And that's an opportunity for encouragement. And we all come to church for different reasons, but many of us are asking the same question. What am I going to get out of this today? But can I challenge some of you to ask yourselves a different question? Not to ask yourself, what am I going to get out of this today? But to challenge yourself with, Who can I encourage today? Who's maybe here that's that's a little down? See, in the book of Hebrews chapter 10, there's this verse that tells us, let us consider. 
That means let us look, let us be intentional, let us have our eyes outward looking for opportunities. Let us be thoughtful about this, how we can spur one another on toward love and good works. Not giving up meeting together as some are is in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. What's interesting is if you do a little word study on this word encourage, you'll find it translated a couple of different ways. It's translated but in several other places, you'll find it translated as the word urge, as, as the word implore, as the word exhort. It carries with it this sense of urgency, that we've got to do this quickly. These words of affirmation have got to come with a sense of urgency. Why? Because the Hebrew writer says there's a day coming. If you're a believer, you know what that day is. It's the day that Jesus is going to return. It's the day we're all going to stand before him. And we're going to give account of what we've done in our life. And as Brian so beautifully mentioned in our communion thoughts, we're not going to stand before him going, am I good enough? The answer to that question is very simply, no, but Jesus is, and he makes you good enough. And you're going to stand there going, is Jesus good enough? Yes, he is. Then you're good. But we need to remind ourselves as that day is approaching, because life wears us down. It attacks us. It comes after us. There's crushing experience there's tremendous times of loss that we go through and it just wears us down and it gets our eyes off of that day and it gets our eyes only on what we're struggling with and before you know it it causes our faith to drift just a little bit slowly subtly just day after day after day and if we don't have that person or those people in our lives that are encouraging us that are Side and calling greater faith out of us, we might get to that day and be far from God. The Hebrew writer says, let's look for opportunities. It's not a verse about you better go to church. It's a verse about why you go to church. That we can urgently exhort and encourage one another because there is a day coming the second thing that we find in Matthew in Mark chapter 5 in this story of this woman with this bleeding issue is this idea of listening intently it says as as she's healed and Jesus looks at her it says she then tells him the whole story of everything she suffered through and I find that really interesting for a couple of reasons one we have no idea how long her story was I mean she's got to go through 12 years worth of suffering to give him the whole story and you've got this frantic father who's probably like hey can we get like the cliff nose version can we talk as we walk can Get to moving, but Jesus just listens intently to her entire story. When you listen to the story of other people, it shows it it shows them that they are seen and that they are valuable. And this may be more important than ever because we live in such a distracted time. We forfeit so many opportunities. I'm speaking to me first. So many opportunities to listen to one another. Because we get distracted by phones and tablets. We forfeit meal times, car rides, time sitting on the couch, time to engage with one another and to listen to each other's stories. And we're forfeiting that for somebody else's that's not there that doesn't even matter. My challenge to you is to learn to listen intently, to create screen-free times, whether that's at your table, whether that's in the car, whatever it is, to listen to one another. Over and over in the book of Proverbs, it, it keeps saying, it, it's written from the perspective of a father to a son. And he keeps saying, my son, pay attention, listen to the instruction. And he re- encourages him over and over again to listen to the instruction of someone older than him. And that's such valuable wisdom young adults. I hope you'll take the time to get to know some of our older members here because they got some crazy stories. I know you think they're all holy and righteous and maybe they are more mature in their faith now, but they ain't all been like that their entire life and they got some crazy stuff that they've done. Not that it's a license for you to do it, but to show you how God is faithful, how he can redeem, 
even in the craziest of circumstances, how he's good all of If you'll learn to listen to their stories. If you're newly married or younger in your marriage, I hope you'll spend time with our folks who have been married 30, 40, 50 plus years. They figured some things out. And that's something that we all learn from. If you're raising young children, I hope you'll spend time learning from those that have raised children whose children are loving the Lord and ask them whatever their secrets are. What did they do right? And they'll probably just tell you just a lot of prayer, right? And it was all God and probably their mother, right? Especially if you ask the dad. But learn to listen. Learn to listen to one another. Older folks, I want to challenge you to take the time to listen to the stories of these younger folks because they are living in a different time than you have gone through and that I have gone through. There's lots to learn, not just how to work your phone, but about what's going on in the world today. The third thing that we learn from this story is the idea of pleasing abundantly, and I want to add to that intentionally. Jesus looks at this woman And the first word he said to her is, daughter, daughter. I wonder the last time she had heard that word. You're a daughter. You're valued. It was the right word for the right time at just the right time. I love this line from Max Lucado. He was describing what biblical encouragement is. He said, it's no casual kind word, but it's a premeditated resolve to lift the spirit of another person, a premeditated resolve. It's not just a happenstance kind word like, oh, you're such a good kid. You're such a nice person. You look nice today. It's a premeditated resolve. Hey, I saw you do this, or I see this within you, and you're coming alongside, and you're calling it out of that person. Maybe something they can't see within themselves. That's biblical encouragement. It's the right word for the right person at just the right time. And it's what Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is calling us to do for one another. I read this story about a young man named Tim. Tim grew up in a home around age seven. His parents divorced. His mother worked a couple of jobs. She worked 16 hours a day as a assistant. And when Tim became a teenager, a lot of his friends were playing video games and enjoying time. Tim had to go get a job to help his family make ends meet, and so he worked at the local movie theater. And at break time, he'd go across the road to a fast food restaurant, and he'd order a small fry and a cup of water. And after that for a few weeks, the owner of the restaurant, John Moniz, saw Tim every day come in. And finally, he walked over to him, and he engaged in conversation. He said, I'm just curious. Why don't you buy more food? I mean, a teenager only eating a small fry and drinking a water? And Tim said, I, that's all I can afford. So John saw the opportunity and started every day that Tim would come over during his break, bringing a sandwich, and the two would sit down and just talk about life. One of the things John said is that Tim was failing one of his classes. He started to help him with his schoolwork. But the most important thing that John shared with Tim was Jesus. The two would swap stories, and Tim learned a lot about life and a lot of wisdom from John. When Tim was 17 years of age, John suddenly died of a pulmonary embolism. And then Tim had to decide what was he going to do with all of the encouragement that he had received from John. And so he made a decision. He set a very ambitious life goal. He said, I want to make an impact on one billion people. Boy, what a lofty goal, isn't it? But he's actually well on his way. You see, in 2013, Tim Scott was sworn as the first African-American senator in the South since the Reconstruction. In this 2024 presidential campaign, Tim Scott ran a very good campaign to gain the Republican nomination. He fell short of that, but is leader in the to make a difference in our country. Tim Scott is the example of what encouragement can do for someone, of how someone can see something 
within another individual that they can't see themselves, they can come alongside them. And they can call that out and encourage someone to become what God wants them to become. That is what Paul says we should do for one another. If you're here today and you need some encouragement, and you need some prayers, our shepherds are going to be up front and in the back, and they'd love to pray with you. They'd love to encourage you and lift you up. And my prayer is that each of us today will become more resolved to have our eyes outward, to pay attention to the body language, to the words, to what's going on in one another's lives so that we can become greater encouragers for one another. And I hope that you'll leave here today feeling encouraged. If you're here today and you've not put Christ on in baptism, you've not experienced yet the greatest encouragement that you could ever experience. When Jesus was baptized in Matthew chapter 3, he came out of the water, the heavens opened, and God looked at him and said, this is my beloved son in who I am well pleased. Well, I don't think the skies are going to part and we're going to hear an audible voice. I do believe that you will feel that approval from God when you rise out of that water because God is saying to you, in you, I am so proud. What greater encouragement could you receive today than to surrender your life to Christ to gain that great approval from God? If we can encourage you in any way, please let us know as together we stand and sing.